Frankie Files. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 10 of the Frankie Files. I'm Frankie Tease. Every first Tuesday I focus on mind control and I've got a really crazy story to expose here uh, which is happening live in the news right now. I bet a lot of you have been paying attention to it. The Sarah Lawrence sex cult in New York has um, started March 10th of 2022. It's getting a lot of media attention because there's an ongoing trial against Lawrence Ray, a.k.a. Larry Gecko. He's charged with 16 counts and some papers say 17. The story is long and a bit of a beast to cover. I won't lie. But I felt like it was worth it regarding mind control and cults. Why? We're seeing in real time testimony of a very mentally deranged individual preying upon young people away from their parents, take control of their lives sexually, financially, domestically, and socially. He eventually controlled all aspects of several of the young people he recruited. I'll do my best here to use several sources to piece together the long and twisted story of how this happened. And you will join me in disbelief. It's right under our nose, just like my recruitment and enslavement in a cult. The techniques used by Ray, I've determined, are trauma-based mind control. He, like many cult leaders, may entice you with improving yourself and preaching about human potential, and soon you're entrenched in financial obligation, sexual assault, torture, and entrapment. How does it go that far? Coercion was a constant for this man who convinced those around him that he was the victim of a government plot due to being an informant in Italian and Russian mob cases from 2000 forward. Colts and human sex trafficking happen right under our noses, folks. And that is one of the reasons I'm whistleblowing about the cults I was in. It's still going on. It's in Long Beach, California. It's called Morningland, and it's been renamed The Monastery. It's at 7th and Molina, and that's in California. So these leaders of cults use psychological warfare, manipulation, and exploit the specific vulnerabilities of each recruit. It's like a symphony of mental chess that they're playing with each individual. They play them against each other. And I've seen this before. But my criminal cult leader died before any conviction took place. They got away with everything. So regarding the Larry Ray sex cult, which is also being called the Sarah Lawrence College sex cult story, I'll first outline the people involved in a quick dramatis persona for those who are listening. So first, location. Sarah Lawrence College is an elite and expensive, sprawling campus set on 44 acres, far enough out of the city to be somewhat removed and feel country, but it's accessible by train. Tuition runs $60,000 a year, room and board another $1,500 more. Lawrence Ray is the main character. He's divorced. He's an ex-convict. He's estranged from one of his children and his ex-wife. He's close to Talia Ray, who attended Sarah Lawrence College in Yonkers, New York. In 2006, he was sentenced to five years probation. He violated the terms of that probation and he was rearrested in 07. He violated those terms and then served six months in jail regarding a custody battle of his child. Talia Ray is... 19 or 20 something daughter of Larry Ray living in townhouse dorm with seven or eight students circa 2010. Claudia Drury is one of the young women who was living in the townhouse on campus of Sarah Lawrence College who met Ray at age 19. She's testified in court and provided documents proving Ray eventually made her one of his prostitutes to pay him back for concocted damages to his stepfather's home, which Claudia helped work on. Heads up, this is all made up. She didn't damage any pipes at his stepfather's house. Santos Rosario was in a dorm and met Ray at Sarah Lawrence College. He must regret it now, but he introduced his two sisters to Ray between 2010 and 2013. 
Now, I just want to put this, interject this. Uh, this is going to be covering about a 10-year period, 2010 to 2019-20. Yelitsa Rosario is one of the sisters Santos introduced, and she became an obedient member of the cult. Felicia Rosario is a young woman who is the older sister of Santos Rosario and had documented mental collapse and attempted suicides while in contact with Ray. Daniel Levin was recruited at some point through the dorm situation on campus and suffered much pain at the hands of Larry Ray. He's published a book after attending a cult recovery group entitled Slonim Woods Nine something referring to the address of the uh, campus housing. Again, that's a memoir about the experience with Ray by Daniel Levin, L-E-V-I-N. Isabella Pollock is being charged alongside of Ray, to my surprise. It sure seems like she was another victim. She pleaded not guilty, but is present on audio and video helping Ray hurt Claudia Drury. I'm going to piece together through various articles the story. Ray had a background as an FBI informant, and he had mafia ties to Al Capone, also known as Scarface, according to lawandcrime.com by Dan Abrams, writer Adam Classfield. Ray informed on securities fraud related to Garfalo, Capo Sr., Montrecci, Persico, and Lombardo. The mob families involved in that case included Gambino, Bonanno, and Genovese. He became an informant when he pleaded guilty on the case reporting on Italian and Russian mob activities. Current charges against Ray are sex trafficking, money laundering, extortion, human trafficking, tax evasion, racketeering, forced labor. He has a 17-count indictment total. It's come out in court, reported on by the Daily Mail UK, that Ray's phone included searches for mind control, cult membership and leaving, how to detect lying, coercive persuasion, and brainwashing. Just a few Google searches by a criminal mind. No big deal. The New York Post reported on March 30th, 2022, that's super recent, a list of Johns who used services of the sex cult, and that was accidentally leaked by U.S. Attorney's Office for Southern District, New York, last week. Isabella Pollock and Felicia Rosario had accounts with huge sums of money transferred from Johns. Then nine transfers to Tar Heel State Dems totaling 15500 were also present. That's where the money laundering came in. The donations were made through Act Blue to candidates and groups. Ray's daughter worked for Lowell Simon State House candidate as a campaign manager. But what's the lead up to the story? Well, one of the best synopses I found on this mess was at a newer YouTube channel you should bookmark if you like true crime stories. The channel is called Scareful Stories. Scareful Story. Her sources used include the New York Post, Daily Mail UK, and Inner City Press, among others. The following synopsis is using her video, and I truncate the story for brevity purposes. But guys... It's worth hearing the progression of how he brought these young people under mind control right in front of everyone. This is how it happens. Larry moved in with the daughter on campus, Talia, as he got out of prison. He started by taking on cooking and cleaning and having movies and discussions in the townhouse. They looked at Ray as a father figure. The townhouse made campus at Sarah Lawrence College had seven to eight people living there. And that's their style of dorms, a bit different from the normal dormitory. Students were disarmed by his helping role, and some began disclosing mental health issues to him that they were struggling with. Larry said he could help them, despite having no training in a psychological field and not being a licensed therapist. He went as far as saying he could help with mental discipline training he had learned in the government. When one of the housemates, Isabella Pollock, went through a bad breakup, Larry swooped in. Laying in Isabella's bed, he stroked her hair and moved soon into her room and slept there. Talia's boyfriend at the time voiced concern about the 50-year-old man bedding with a 19-year-old girl, but nothing came of it. During the winter break, Larry called Isabella's parent and said she wouldn't be coming home for the break because Talia revealed to him she'd been sexually abused by a family friend. He convinced Talia that her mom allowed this and going home would jeopardize her mental health. Here's a side note from 
yours truly, a cult survivor. It seems like this was the first recruit. He found her weakness, exploited it, and then used it to cut ties to her family, giving him full access. He's now a replacement for family and became a mentor. And also, he got sex. Note, this is how it's done. The Frankie Files. So, during the winter break, Larry, his daughter, Talia, Talia's boyfriend, and Isabella hung out. Larry's friend gave him access to an apartment in New York City, so they went off campus. While there, Larry began to control their lives. Note, this is why trafficking is so important. When Larry successfully got these people off campus to a location he controlled, aka a second location, even though it's a long-term kidnapping, it really is a second location. That's the first step in his process. He's gaining a foothold now, a control, and he has a place to do it. Back to the story. Larry started choosing what they ate, what they wore, and where they would go. He suggested Talia's boyfriend go off his antipsychotic meds. When the break ended, they returned to campus. Talia's boyfriend was so concerned that he broke up with Talia. Now Larry started working on mental real estate. Larry began creeping into their minds using the quest for potential doctrine, potentialism theory, a.k.a. Q4P, quest for potential. Note, a lot of religious and non-religious cults play on the human potential angle. It's now a whole business model which started in the 70s or maybe at the beginning of time. <laughs> the human potential market breeds cults and cult leaders. Back to the story. Another roommate, Claudia, became interested in Q4P. Though she hadn't liked Larry, he began having one-on-one -on -one meetings with her to win her over. She told others Larry had diagnosed her with schizophrenia. <laughs> Whew. This guy's out of control. Claudia's friends were concerned about her sudden personality change and getting false diagnosis from a layman, not a doctor. Daniel Levin, another housemate, thought this was odd, but women seemed to trust Larry Ray. The girls suggested he consult Ray. So Talia, Isabella, and Claudia were already hooked and now recruiting for Larry. Daniel was having girl troubles, and Larry then suggested he break off the relationship. Turns out there was a motive to be revealed later. With nowhere to go for summer and not wanting to go home for summer break, he was taken in by Larry and the gang. They went again to the one-bedroom New York apartment for summer. So it's Larry, Claudia, Isabella, Santos Rosario, and the other roommate, Dan Levin, in a one-bedroom apartment. And Talia. Did I say Talia? So Larry provided good dinners, deep discussion, nights out, and movies. He began to share very personal things with the kids. He set up a domain name business and had all the hands on deck to help him earn money. What I did on my summer vacation, huh? He began waking them with loud music, which added the classic sleep deprivation technique into the mix. This was conditioning. So is getting people to share their personal info. This is to be used on a victim later, of course. Mistakes he called out were turned into transgressions that must be worked through in the group until there's a breakthrough. Larry demanded confessions, very communist and cult in nature there too. They faked it when there wasn't a breakthrough because of peer pressure. Confessions, which were often fake to appease Larry, were turned into debt for things they did wrong. Let the money scam begin. Claudia's parent would talk to her for hours in an effort to separate her from Ray, but she was convinced that his direction was improving her as a person. This is the classic difficulty. When someone has control of your everyday life, the parents are not present to break that control up. Now they risk estrangement. That happened to me. My mom was estranged systematically. And then they kicked her out and kept us kids. This stuff is textbook cult leader modus operandi. Claudia's parents even reported their concerns to the campus dean at Sarah Lawrence College about a 50-year-old father living in a dorm with students. After two meetings, it yielded only a comment that the dean cannot control a dad wanting to visit his daughter. Amazing. 
There are other complaints on record about him living on campus, too. Daniel was now under the spell, too, like Claudia and Isabella. After suggesting Daniel break up with his girlfriend, Larry suggested he date Isabella. Not just that, he decided to help coach them through sex, which sometimes involved jumping in and having a three-way. Yikes. So take note of these just noticeable differences. I'm interjecting that with each thing, Larry manipulated them into a direction he had in mind. One, he got them to help him create an income for him via GoDaddy domain sales. Two, he tricked them into paying him for repairs or transgressions after demanding all be known and confessed to the group. Three, he began sexually controlling them. So back to the story. Isabella and Daniel went to study abroad for a year. Lucky them. However, Larry kept a finger on them by having them Skype call him and coach them through sex on cam. While he watched, what a swell guy. Now, Larry began recruiting. Santos Rosario introduces his sisters to Larry from off campus. Yalitza was a student at Columbia, and the other sister of Santos, Felicia, was a Harvard graduate doing a medical residency in Los Angeles. Larry convinced Felicia to ditch her residency and come live in New York. He convinces her that she's also a target of the widespread conspiracy after him. Once in New York, he beds her, another person under his control. He would at times call Felicia his wife, and also Isabella too. Alrighty then. The amount of delusion is palpable now. Claudia was now back at school on campus, and Daniel stayed to live at the New York apartment with Larry. Things got weirder as Larry got bolder. Locks and handles were removed from all doors to eliminate privacy. Those parents who questioned their kids' involvement with Larry were told by the kids he's helping, not hurting us. Parents were more afraid of not alienating their kids at this point, as I mentioned earlier, a common trick played by cults and religions. Meanwhile, Larry convinced Claudia that her mother never loved her. Next, Larry got the kids to get money from their parents for perceived damages owed. Claudia, Isabella, Elitza and Felicia were put to work on his stepfather's house in North Carolina. None of that was in their lesson plans, I bet. See how off course they were? He told them they damaged a drainage ditch while doing forced labor for him, and they owed him hundreds of thousands of dollars. Kids got money from their parents for the alleged debt. Claudia even once asked a friend of hers for $500,000. Both Claudia and Santos' parents went to the police. With Santos so convinced he owed damages that he told his folks he would kill himself if they didn't give him money to pay back Larry. Relenting, they sold their home to get the money. Police told parents they're adults and allowed to associate with whomever they want. Still amazing, right? By senior year, Daniel attempted to distance himself. Larry's daughter missed a college application deadline, and Daniel was told that it was his fault. Larry then tortured Daniel with saran wrap and foil sexually. Daniel knew he did nothing but could not get away at that point. Daniel was made to wear dress and parade through the lobby at the New York apartment until seen by neighbors. Claudia was now at Columbia, but still unable to work off the debt with a part-time job. That debt was what Larry claimed she owed him. She began prostituting herself to pay him back but he had started that. At $8,000 a session, he got all the cash. She also attempted suiciding during this time. In fact, so had Yulitsa, Isabella during their time with Larry. Both had tried to commit suicide. Great guy. Larry's friend tried to evict him from the New York apartment. And during that trial, all three women displayed babble of government conspiracies that he had filled their heads with. Also during the trial, Talk of them poisoning Larry and each other surfaced, but somehow was ignored by the courts. You have to wonder where the buck stops in this story. They loved Larry now and saw him as a victim of the government. Daniel joined a group for cult survivors and began to see what he was put through. Claudia told a friend about the torture of being tied to a chair and suffocated off and on for hours with cellophane, and the friend helped her to move out and get help. In February of 2020, Larry Way was arrested on 17 counts. Isabella was also arrested and charged for conspiring with Larry. 
Larry and Isabella are being tried separately and are facing up to life in prison. The Frankie Files. Discovery so far includes 1,462 documents, 320 audio files, 256 video files. Larry is accused of using the pictures and videos to demean and control and extort people. But there's more. March 22, CorruptionbyCops.com posted this. The Sarah Lawrence sex cult trial was abruptly halted late Tuesday morning as defendant Larry Ray was taken away in an ambulance after suffering a medical emergency in court. An attorney for Ray called for a break in the middle of proceedings today after his client shook and gasped behind his mask. Judge Louis Lima cleared the courtroom while court officers rushed in with a first aid kit and defibrillator and medic followed on. Ray, 62, was stretchered out of Manhattan Federal Court and onto a waiting ambulance outside. The incident is the second time the trial has been interrupted in this way and came after close to three and a half hours of dramatic and disturbing testimony from former cult member Claudia Drury. Last week, the court was forced to pause proceedings for several hours for Ray to recover from a seizure he suffered in lockup earlier in the day. Trigger warning. Some people may find details from this testimony offensive. Please proceed with caution. Over two days of testimony, alleged victim Claudia Drury told the court how Ray allegedly forced her into a life of prostitution, abused her, and threatened to kill her after ingratiating himself with her and her friends when she was a student at Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville, New York. He was treated with oxygen before being brought back inside the courtroom to resume testimony. The former convict is on trial for alleged sex trafficking. His daughter's friends from a dorm on the campus of the elite New York Liberal Arts College. The emergency marked the end of the morning during which jurors heard often harrowing testimony from Drury, 31, as she chronicled in disturbing detail how Ray allegedly bullied and groomed her into a life of prostitution, convincing her she had to make amends for egregious wrongs and repay a debt of more than $100,000. On Monday, the court heard how Drury and fellow students were allegedly worn down by weeks of physical privation and psychological abuse, doing hard labor at the home of Ray's stepfather in North Carolina. Tuesday, Assistant U.S. Attorney Daniel Sassoon focused on the sexual grooming that prosecutors claim Ray used to funnel Drury into a life of prostitution, from which he garnered more than $2.5 million. Drury told the court that Ray suggested she take part in a gangbang, telling her that sex with multiple partners was liberating and fun. She told how he set her sexual challenges that she, already unraveling, took in a bid to win his favor make repairs for wrongs of which he accused her. The accusations were primarily of damage to property, but escalated to an insistence that she had poisoned him and his daughter, Talia. He told me to take a cab ride, and at the end of it, instead of paying, suggest I had sex with the driver instead, jury told the court. Isabella Pollock is accused of being Ray's lieutenant and conspirator. She also said that by this time she had built up so much self-hate that she found an outlet and relief in the pain of BDSM. On some level, she felt she deserved the punishment for all the supposed wrongs of which she said Ray accused her across a sustained campaign of coercion. She recalled one occasion on which Ray had participated in BDSM when she returned home during winter break from her year studying abroad in 2012. She says, I was at Larry's, Isabella and Iben were there, and Larry instructed Isabella to bind me with my ankles to my wrists. She did very light impact with a whip. Then Larry told Iban to use the same dildo he had on Dan, Daniel Levin, on another occasion, to penetrate me, and it didn't fit, and it was very painful. Larry told me, relax, Isabella can fit it in. You'll get there. But I didn't. Claudia Drury told the court how, across months of constant abuse, she became convinced that she had caused more than $100,000 worth of damage to the North Carolina property 
and that she had poisoned Ray, his daughter, and others. She came to believe that she had to repay the funds, money she simply did not have, and that she was at risk of going to prison. Ray played on her fears, often speaking graphically about jail and what would happen to her there. He talked about it for years and years. He described in detail the size of prison cells. Made me walk the size of a prison cell, she said. Quote, he said I would never be able to listen to the music I wanted to in prison. That colors would fade. He told me graphic things about what people would do to me because I was smaller. He said that women would make me their bitch, and he described how they would use the restroom and defecate and use my face and tongue as toilet paper. He talked about it many times in many different ways. Ultimately, she said, I felt extremely trapped, extremely overwhelmed, detached from reality and from her parents, with whom she barely spoke at the height of their association, Claudia Drury claimed that she complied to Ray's suggestion that she turn to prostitution to pay him back. She had, she said, once thought she could simply graduate and get a job and pay him back, but that wasn't nearly fast enough for Larry. The first time she saw a client, she said she charged $700. She recalled the experience as weird and creepy, but said she was glad to get the money. She intended to give 200 to Ray and keep 500 for living expenses, but she said Ray took the lot. That's when she came to understand that is how it would be from then on. Under Ray's insistence, she said, she left her escort agency and went freelance in a bid to earn more and avoid the agency taking a cut. She said, quote, I thought that I would go to prison if I displeased Ray, but I also thought it was the only way I had to repair something I had done that was egregiously morally wrong something that's essentially unforgivable. Drury worked as a prostitute from the beginning of 2015 to April 8, 2019. At her most profitable, she saw three or more clients a day, charging $2,000 an hour, $2,400 for two hours, with fees rising in increments from there. She said she handed most of her money to Ray and Isabella Pollock, his co-accused and so-called lieutenant. On two occasions, Ray told Claudia and Isabella to be sexual with each other while he watched. On other occasions, Ray would use the props that he told her to buy for clients. Her voice tipping so the judge had to remind her to speak up, Drury listed the props. Handcuffs, crops, floggers, leash, collar, ball gag, dildos. The difference, she said, between clients using these and Ray was that when she told the clients to stop, she knew that they would. With Ray, she said, I was scared. She said that she continued to believe she owed Ray money until the day I left, essentially. Earlier on Tuesday, a list of Drury's alleged clients was inadvertently published online. The list, which was entered into evidence under seal, included lawyers, businessmen, and socialites throughout the tri-state area. The allegations involving the latest case were laid out in a lengthy article by New York Magazine's The Cut, in 2019. That included accounts from some of the purported cult members. Okay, to wrap it up, you guys should definitely stay tuned to this unfolding story. It's a truly harrowing tale about how influence can enslave people. There's always some opportunist out there ready to do it. I'm certainly left with nothing but sympathy for those unfortunate people who crossed Larry's path. I'm also surprised his daughter isn't being tried, but Isabella is one of his recruits. I find it astounding how little accurate coverage is happening on this true cult story unfolding before us in America. Please follow it on your favorite place to hear podcasts. Gaining followers helps the show to grow. So tell a friend. To see the list of where we broadcast or how to donate to our production, please visit frankiefilespodcast.com. Until next time. Frankie Files